the most important thing you can do is furnish your mind with what you would like to have if you had nothing except what you could carry around in your mind. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudoua, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. Andrew, episode 300. I can't believe it. I know. 300 times. 300 weeks? Yes. That sounds like a decade's worth of time. No. Not quite. No, not quite. Okay. So we do a podcast every week, and so 300 weeks would be... Six years. Close to six years. Close to six years. So... It's almost a decade. (laughs) So as what we normally do on the 10, so episode 10 episode 20 and et cetera, et cetera, we do an Ask Andrew Anything. And generally we poll our podcast listeners and ask them, please just send in some of your questions and we'll be, we'll try to answer them. And, and this is an important thing that I think you know, but our lovely customer service team actually takes all of those questions. And if we don't answer them on a podcast, they are answered via email. So we do try to not withhold help. We, we try to leave no question unanswered. Right. So we have a few questions from parents and teachers that I'll start with. Okay. okay. And this one comes from Laura in Canada. And she says, do I start my seven-year-old with handwriting or with printing the letters? I know 40 years ago back in Europe, we were started straight on cursive, never to print for the rest of the school years. And we did great. Well, the answer to the question is yes, you do one or the other. <clears throat> there is increasing interest in cursive first. And there are some very good arguments for cursive first. Uh, and, of course, in, in my talk, uh, Pen and Paper, What the Research Says, or Paper and Pen, I can't remember which way it goes, um, you know, I have some of that research noted. So that's an audio talk people could listen to. Link in the show notes. But um, it is interesting to note that before typewriters, Mm -hmm. so early, mid-1800s and before, everyone used, did cursive first. Mm -hmm. So all children were taught cursive first. Now, at what age that happened probably varied. Um, And then for some reason, when typewriters came in, people started to think, well, if we don't teach them to print or what's often called manuscript, if we don't teach them that, they won't be able to read typewriters. But that doesn't make sense because there had been printed books long before there were typewriters. So um, it, as an aid to reading, I don't think the argument for printing is very good. Uh, another argument for cursive first is that you're less likely to reverse letters because you're going always in one direction the kinesthetic motion between for example a d and a b are very very different so if you're printing and you have to wrestle with a b and a d and you have that kind of mild dyslexia that probably most young children go through a phase of easily being confused um, printing is going to make it more likely to mix those things up Uh, There's a good argument for cursive in terms of it being um, something that builds attentiveness or builds attention span because you write one letter, I'm done, what's next? But if you're learning cursive, you've got to get all the letters in the word before you're done. Mm -hmm. So there's the value there. Um, And then another one, and I'll, I'll stop at this, I think this may be one of the best ones, is that if you teach printing, you know, up through, say, grade one, two, and then you introduce 
cursive, say in grade three, which is the way it's done in many places, there's a long period of time where the kids are going backward in terms of confidence, speed, and aptness because they're learning something that is harder than, they're learning something that is different than what they're used to. Whereas if you start with cursive, there's no need to go backwards to it. And so speed, confidence, and all that, uh, there's no loss there. And if you want to, you can certainly learn to do printing after you've learned cursive. So, uh, and there, you know, there are many people who grew up in a time and place where everyone did cursive first and there was no debate on this. Um, you know, I, I also have met some parents who tried it and said it was just overwhelming, frustrating, and they went back and did kind of the standard, let's learn to print mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's an absolute here, but if you feel like you could try it, I would encourage it. Good. Sounds great. So I have a question from Christina from Romania. Oh, wonderful. And I'm sure you can imagine this. If coming from a different country or language with a 13-year-old child who is fluent in English, where should I start? Well, and I don't know if she's actually talking about teaching her child to write or herself. Her, you know, and, you know, we did do a podcast recently, and we can refer back to that. On the foreign language notes. learners. Yeah, yeah, and just the idea that IEW is actually a great tool to help English language learners. Yeah, I mean... If I, I, I can only answer this by thinking if I were to go start learning a foreign language right now mm -hmm. or if I were to relearn a foreign language that I learned a little bit of some time ago, I would do three things. One is, first and most importantly, I would copy that language, just copy sentences, copy paragraphs, just copy it, just so that I'm getting intimate kind of slow motion reflection on the words, the s sentence structures, and the flow. I would try to find something very, very simple that I could understand, mm -hmm. but I would just practice copying. Well, the nice thing for Christina is that the alphabet is the same in Romania yes, as it yes. is in English. Yes. <laughs> the, the second thing is I would memorize some poems in that language. I would pick something, I, I would try to find someone who could give me some suggestions. <laughs> Link in the show notes for <clears throat> linguistic development. development through poetry memorization. But I would try to memorize some poems mm -hmm. because that does also give you uh, vocabulary enrichment. It strengthens your familiarity with the grammar and the syntax mm -hmm. and even leads you into kind of a, a less colloquial and more literary mm -hmm. right. use of, of language. Right. And then the third thing is I would use the method of keyword outlines uh, to practice taking notes, retelling, and then rewriting mm -hmm. in that language, and then moving on from there through the nine units. We've had so many, many people who, you know, parents or teachers for whom English was not their first language do our TWSS course and say, why didn't I get this years ago? Right. It's so helpful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is just kind of a general statement from Kelly from the United States. She says, could you please give us some encouragement about dyslexia in IEW, please? I feel so discouraged, but absolutely have seen how our dyslexic kids have benefited from the IEW process. Well, there's encouragement all over Facebook. <laughs> Um, that all he, all you, she would have to do is go to one of our IEW Facebook page systems and post that, and there would be a dozen people that would answer it. I think the most dramatic one was the one I showed you just last week. Uh, a mom who said, you know, dis dysgraphic, couldn't write. He dictated everything for, what was it, two years? Um... And then now he's 13, and he went to take a standardized test, and the results were his writing is 
at a 30-year-old right. level, <laughs> and he will do very well in any academic environment where writing is yeah. needed. Yeah. And she was just, she was blown away because she went through that period of hopelessness, like, I'm doing everything for him. Right. But she believed what I say when I say, um, number one, trust the system, and number two, they will reach a point where they say, okay, mom, I got it. Let me do this myself. But you can't force that, right? So you just help and help and help and help as much as needed, as, as I say in the Four Deadly Errors talk. And then one day, it'll happen. But I can't guarantee, is that going to be two months, two years, five years? Uh, but, but it will, and it does. And it's very, very rare to meet an adult who's childhood dyslexia prevented them from learning to read and write. I mean, that is, that is rarer than almost any case I can think of. I mean, it's, it's so rare. I've never met a person that was so dyslexic, they never learned to read and write. Our anxiety comes when they're not learning to read and write according to the schedule that the world says because you're X years old, you have to be in Y grade, and the nth grade standard dictates, and you're not there, and so you feel this hopelessness, this failure. The most important thing is not, especially when it comes to the arts of language, listen, speak, read, write, think, the most important thing isn't where is a child in relation to other children of that age, but where is that child in relation to where they were? And is progress happening? Because if progress is happening, there's always hope. And I, I will give another word of encouragement. And we can link to um, Chris's yep. podcast. Your son. My yeah. son, who didn't read a book till he was 12 years old. And he didn't. He was self-aware. He was frustrated that he didn't know how to read and was very motivated to learn how to read. Well, he, he was later in the right. in the pro process but you know his podcast he points out there are some real advantages mm -hmm. to having a dyslexic mm -hmm. brain you see the world differently you're more likely to become entrepreneurial you sometimes make these intuitive leaps most of the kids if they don't have an auditory processing issue going on as well have they develop these incredible auditory memories and they're able to hear something once and recite a huge chunk of it back. So uh, there, are, there are actually some advantages. And we have all these podcasts, the IDs, the Dyslexic Advantage, Susan Barton, all that. So, uh, yes, never despair and realize that the only thing that's causing your anxiety is this attachment to age-based grade-level expectations that are a very, very new and unfortunate development in modern education. Okay, this is from Natalia, and she's from the United States. She says, what are the benefits of poetry work and memorization? As an elementary and middle school student in Ukraine back in the day, we did a lot of memorization. Seems like American students are not exposed to it at all. I'm trying to convince my student that, is a, that it is a worthwhile program to add to our homeschool schedule. And I just want to add to this. I talked to a group of teachers, you know, at a traditional school in Orange County, California, and the middle school teacher was saying, how do I motivate? She knew the value of memoriza memorizing poetry, but her junior high students were kind of like, yeah, I don't want to do this. Well, junior high students are very often like, yeah, I don't want to do this, about <laughs> almost everything. <laughs> That's true. So you don't listen to that. Mm -hmm. You just do it, mm -hmm. right? So if you start with the right kind of poems, right, and with, you know, with junior high school kids, boys in particular, things that have some humor, things that have a storyline, mm -hmm. and you just start doing it every day, they will pretty soon join in. And... They may or may not have an, a belief that this is useful, but they also don't have a belief that knowing how to divide fractions is useful. <laughs> right. 
So we don't cater to the beliefs of students about what will be useful in their life because they are not old enough to actually know yet. So that's why we need wise teachers and parents to say, this has value, we will do it. And then you just do it. And what's interesting is I have never met a kid who's memorized a lot of poetry and doesn't love the fact that they know a lot of poetry. And one little story I'll throw in, um, this uh, mom came to me and said, yeah, I, I tried this with my son, and he totally fought it and fought it, but we did it anyway. And then he went to Boy Scout camp that summer, and he came home and said, Mom, i got to learn a whole lot more poems. And she said, why? And he said, well, because all the boys, they like to hear the poems. He was, he was like the superstar of the campfire reciting all these poems from memory right. to all these, you know, middle school, probably age Boy Scouts. Right. So uh, it has value. Natalia grew up knowing that, experiencing that firsthand. And so now it's just bring that cultural thing into your life with your kids. And, uh, you know, a, a way to think about this, too, is what if you lost everything, right? What if you were sometime in place in a situation where you had no books, no internet? What would you have? Well, it would be whatever you're carrying around in your brain. So if you have things like, you know, scripture or prayers or poems or excerpts from famous speeches or even advertising jingles, <laughs> right, in your brain— you could access that to greater or lesser benefit. So in a way, it's kind of like the most important thing you can do is furnish your mind with what you would like to have if you had nothing except what you could carry around in your mind. I don't know that a junior higher could necessarily think be that have that much force. No, but, but you know, that that is something to think about. Sure. Absolutely. You know. Yep. Okay. So this is another challenging student, perhaps challenging. I'm having a hard time communicating. This is from Margaret from the United States. I'm having a hard time communicating to my son the steps of why we do the outlines in only three words, keyword outlines. So they're new to IEW. Then those words will create a sentence when he, when we write the paragraph, he is 10 and just not grasping the why we do this. He thinks we should just go for it, write the paragraph and be done with it. This is our first time doing IEW and writing is a struggle. Well, um, first of all, you won't convince a 10 year old that this is good for him or that there's a reason. So don't bother. I mean, we, we want to, but 10 year olds just don't think entirely like, if you could prove to me why this is good for me, I would do it. They're thinking, what's good for me is to be done with this so I can go play with Legos and make forts and be a boy. So you don't have to convince him. You just have to stay convinced yourself. Uh, I would say that if it's a super struggle, then just break it into very small steps. Be sure you have a big whiteboard. I've said this many, many times. Do not try to teach our writing program without a whiteboard in your teaching environment because you can do a lot of it together on the board. And he may or may, you can make a keyword outline together, and then he may or may not copy it, but at least you've got it. So you're separating complexity. Yeah, it's not the most important thing um, to be able to write something but it becomes the most important tool to be able to write well. Yeah. So if you start doing outlines in unit one and two, and you keep going with outlines, and you go all the way through, and you always separate the complexity of first you figure out what to write, then you figure out how you want to write that, mm -hmm. you always get better writing. And I will throw in the humorous story of the little girl. I was at a convention, I think in Colorado, and I was setting up the booth, and I was kind of laying out the books and video tapes. I think it was that long ago, VHS. And this girl walks up to me. She's probably 12 or 13. 
And she goes, I know you. And I said, oh, you've watched me on the video? She goes, yes, you're the writing guy. And I said, well, how's it going? She goes, I hate it. And I said, what do you hate the most? And she said, outlines. And I said, okay, fair enough. Do they help you write better? And this is what she said, of course. I mean, she was just in that zone of I'm going to have an attitude and I'm going to play with this guy. Uh, a little bit like this letter I got from a, probably a boy of the same age just recently. He wrote a letter, basically, IEW is horrible, I hate it. But when I'm older, I'm sure I'll be grateful I did it. And I wrote back and said, I think you're a smart guy because you know that even though you hate it now, you'd probably be grateful when you're older. So that, that was insightful. So um, just do the outlines and don't negotiate. Don't negotiate, exactly. Okay, so speaking of rascally students, let's switch the okay. switch the tempo a little All bit. All right, so, these, are, these are less serious. Yeah, perhaps. Perhaps. Right. So Rosalind, who's nine, asks, Mr. Pudwa, if you don't like writing, <laughs> why did you decide to become a writing teacher? <laughs> there are so many ways to answer that question. Um, one answer would be, I kind of stumbled into it accidentally and then found that I liked the system because it helped me dislike less the writing. Another answer would be I was just desperately trying to start a little side business and make more money so I could afford to teach music. Probably the real answer is um, it was destiny. It was providence, God's hand, all of the all of the factors lined up, and I started kind of in faith, and it just kept going and going and going. And looking back, you know, I'm just profoundly grateful for, I would say, the supernatural blessings, the supernatural assistance, and the fact that, you know, everyone who's in this room right now and half the people, you know, everyone who works for us, it was God who brought them to IEW. Believe it or not. <laughs> so Chelsea from New South Wales, Australia, she says, how do I get better with thinking up clinchers? Oh, that's a good question. And she's eight. An eight-year-old from Australia, how do I get better at thinking up clinchers? Mm, I love it. Well, the first thing you can do if you can't think of anything is take the topic sentence, rewrite the exact same sentence, and then try to change a few words, maybe using a thesaurus tool or something like that. The next approach would be just look at the last sentence, whatever you wrote. Look at your topic sentence and see if you can get at least two words from the topic sentence somehow into the last sentence you wrote, and boom, it becomes a clincher. So those would be the two strategies I would use. And the third one is I would just go ask someone to say, you know, I would just go ask someone and say, could you help me think of a good clincher for this paragraph? And I'm sure there's some helpful older people that would be able to do that. Yep, that's very good. Very good, Chelsea. We like questions oh, like that. from Australia. Yeah, exactly. That's encouraging. Okay, so Jenna and Andrew, they are siblings, so they each have a question for you. Jenna asks... If I erase, will you really bite the eraser off my pencil? If you're in my class and you erase, I will indeed come over and bite the eraser off your pencil. I have done this many, many times, um, and only once have I regretted it. Uh, usually it gets a good laugh, but one time I did it, and this little girl just burst into tears because this was like a super special pencil. It was all decorated with flowery hearts or whatever, and she just could not recover. And I offered to buy her a whole box of wonderful, beautiful pencils. But So it's always a gamble. But uh, for the most part, uh, it usually is a, I think, interesting memory that not only the child whose eraser I bit, but everyone in the room will remember for a while. And there's a little bit of background for some of our listeners who 
do not know the convert to pens paper that you wrote. So right. we'll go ahead and put a link in the show notes to that to give a defense of why pen is better than pencil, especially when doing a rough draft. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, then Andrew, her. What a great name. I know, right? He's going to go far. Andrew says, how did you come up with the upside down V care wedgie thingy? <laughs> Well, that's what it looks like. It does look the like. upside down V carrot wedgie thingy. Uh, it's the mark you use to insert Which is actually called? A carrot. But here's what most people don't know. It is not spelled like the vegetable because it's shaped like a carrot tip. It's a Latin word, C-A-R-E-T, which literally means it is missing. Oh, dear. Okay. Right? Nice. And so when you put carrot, um, it means there's something missing. There's a joke in one of the Shakespeare plays about this, and I can't remember which one, but it's, it's embedded in a line, and it's like a double entendre. Uh, but it's, it's a Latin word. And a lot of our grammar and literary terminology comes from the Latin. Is it is it somewhat encouraging listeners to know that he really knows what it's called and that he's not just making up words for editing marks? Well, no, I, <laughs> I'm perfectly happy to make up words. Of course you are. Okay, so Miriam, is this is this another Miriam? Did I already ask about a Miriam? Okay, she's nine. Okay, and she wants to know: Do you make up your own jokes? No, I am not smart enough to make up jokes. The few that I have made up were just not very good. Uh, so I, I am a collector of jokes, um, much like children would collect beautiful rocks or leaves. Or when I was her age, I collected sand dollars from the from the beach where we used to go swimming. And so I just happen to like to collect useful things. And I'm pretty sure jokes are one of the most useful things you can carry around in your brain. There's a, a whole science of the relationship between laughter mm. and learning. Sure. Oh, yeah. Um, it Laughter does so many good things for the body. It's good for the physiology. It's good for n the brain function. Um, it's good for the social environment. If people laugh together, it's very hard, if not impossible, for them to be angry right and so laughter is kind of a universal bonding experience um, so I always start classes with a few jokes just to get off on the right foot and then I always look for opportunities to say or do something that would make students chuckle, chuckle. Uh, it increases attentiveness and learning is just better. So that is probably one of the most, and I have a talk on this called Humor in Teaching and Speaking. Right. Uh, it's one of my favorite talks to give because I basically just tell jokes for an hour. Right, exactly. And but I do talk about some of the research that I just mentioned. Right, and I will end this Miriam's comment here. She says, and I think you are a great teacher. Oh, well, thank you, Miriam. Yeah. Okay, so... Caleb, who's 16, okay. would like to know, what is your favorite descriptive word? Well, I'm very partial toward the word behemothic. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I don't know why. It I is guess so big. <clears throat> it's big. It's unusual. It just kind of rolls off the tongue. It's a biblical allusion, so it's got a, a richness and a depth and a history to it. Um, I don't know. It's just, what's his favorite descriptive <laughs> word? I don't Caleb, know. Caleb, let us know. You're 16. Let us know. So Hannah wants to know, what is your address and where do you live? I have a letter for you. So maybe she's going to complain about the writing program. So yeah, all correspondence to me uh, goes to the IEW address. Um. I, I actually don't even like getting any mail in the mailbox at my house because there's no guarantee that it doesn't end up in a pile <laughs> right. somewhere and then I miss like an important bill or something. So I get all my mail 
at 8799 North 387 Road, Locust Grove, Oklahoma 74352. There you go, Hannah. So, and we have three. We have three buildings at IEW. We just have one address. It's our main shipping, receiving postal address, and yep. uh, I get it as quickly and sometimes faster than I would at any other address. So earlier today, before this podcast recording, you invited students to come visit us. Yes. And I would just encourage students if you are interested in doing that, please email or call us first so we can tell you where Mr. Poudoua actually is <laughs> right. that day. Because it could be one of three different places. It could be yeah. one of many different places. Yeah. 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 So, okay, last... No, I've got a couple more. I think we've got time we've for got a couple two, more. We've got two more minutes? All right. Yeah, okay. So, Peter, who is six years old, wants to know your shirt size. Peter, who is six years old, right. wants to know my shirt size. Yes. I know it's different than what it was a few years ago. That is ago. a very interesting question. So... My dress shirt <laughs> size is 15 and a half collar, 34 sleeve. My t-shirt size would be large. But I don't wear t-shirts except under dress shirts most of the time. Sarah asked, she's 12 years old, where do the source texts come from? Hmm. Well, it would depend on what she's looking at or asking about. But we have a network, a team uh, of writers who kind of brainstorm ideas. We've tried to come up with themes. We, we have general principles, like they have to be interesting as much as possible, appropriate to the reading level, and then, you know, we all contribute to that. So theme-based books authors, contributors, um, the original student intensive and continuation course, I, I wrote most of those. Mm -hmm. And then the SSS, we had, oh, I don't know, probably half a dozen people at least involved in that, right? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Even you have written I, source text. I have, you know, it, I was going to admit that, but then I thought, well, maybe maybe this student doesn't like the source text and so I wouldn't want to necessarily no but they're you know as as Andrew said we do try to make them most of all interesting no I shouldn't say most of all appropriate for the source for the unit for the unit because you know if you're writing a narrative it needs to be a story right or and, and something not too long not too long right but then we're also looking for something that's um, reading level is appropriate for the grade level that the child and is and we at. we need to create stuff that is not copyrighted, right. although we have from time to time used source texts that are old enough to be in the public domain. It's true. So. It's true. So it's it's actually really fun. Yeah. To contribute to that. So good questions. Well, really good questions, both from our teaching parents and from our parents who are not teaching, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. And from the kids. School for, and yeah. the kids, yes, we love getting questions from our kids. So congratulations on episode 300. 300. And yeah. congratulations to you, and thank you for keeping this going yeah. so long. <laughs> I wonder if we'll make it to five. I Well, only God knows that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. All right. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. Here you can also find show notes and relevant links from today's broadcast. One last thing. Would you mind going to iTunes to rate and review our podcast? This really helps other smart, caring listeners like you find us. Thanks so much.